So how are other things going around? So I guess you, you guys had a chance to look at the homework project too, right? Um, are there any questions? It's basically from your book, right? It's trying to implement one of the, some primitive using some of the primitives that we will see in the next few lectures, right? Um, right? So today I'd like to continue with, with some of the synchronization stuff. So we, uh, last class we were looking at some of the ways of implementing uh, synchronization techniques. You know, one of them was the hardware-based techniques. We looked at the Peterson's algorithm. The software-based, and I said it won't work in most modern processors because the, uh, of the load and store instructions, right? So I'm gonna go a little bit into another construct called summer force and monitors towards the end of the semester, the, this uh, lecture. But first I want to go through a couple of classic problems. I mean, we'll see these problems a lot. We'll, we'll, we'll use them to look at other techniques, right? These are classic problems, not, not just because they are, they are funny, but, but mostly because they expose different aspects of synchronization. So if you have multiple threads operating on a single data item, right? These examples show different ways how the, the systems can behave. So these are considered to be classical because they are thought to be fundamental to all these kind of uh, applications, and so we'll, we'll look at them, right? And over the next class, we'll see how we can solve some of these problems using semaphores, monitors, what have you. Right. So the bounded buffer problem we, we have been looking at before, right? In the last few lectures, we kind of touched on that. So the idea is there's a producer, there's a consumer, and there's a bounded buffer, let's say uh, N. So there's a buffer which can hold N items. The consumer reads stuff off of it, the producer puts stuff into it, the producer cannot put anything more than the size of the buffer. So the producer cannot produce more than N. So if you produce more than N, you have to wait. And if you have less than zero or, or zero, then the consumer will wait. So this is kind of a producer produces more stuff, consumers take, take it off the queue, right? And this is a very, very normal thing. So this is sort of how you would build your IO devices and stuff. You're producing some things, you put them in a buffer, Right? and eventually it goes into your hard disk or CD or what have you, right? And if you're producing too fast, then the producer has to stop, and the buffer kind of makes sure that these, the speeds are matched most of the time, right? If the buffer is big enough, then the consumer and the producer can go off at different times and different speeds for a little bit, and it cushions the stuff, right? A more variation of that, which is more of what you see in database kind of workload, is a reader-writer problem. The reader-writer problem says that there are there is many readers and there is few writers, right? But the, the, the essential way of doing this stuff is there can only be one writer updating a value, but there can be many readers reading what was written, right? So if you want to check for your check for the game scores or whatever, right? You can have as many web clients looking at what the score was, but only one can be updating at one time, right? And you also require exclusive access to that one write, because otherwise you'll see inconsistent data, right? So if you're looking at, say, a basketball game or something, right, and if you want to see, add everything up, so if you want to make sure that the player scores summed up becomes a team score and everything, right? So you want to make this, operation all at once. You want to make sure that the player scores are updated, the totals are updated, and all those things. So while this is going on, you don't want anybody else to read it. But once the data is written, any number of users can share it. So they use, the readers share differently from the writers. The, the writers are exclusive right, and the readers are shared. Any number of readers can share, because the, um, it's, it's not bad, right? So that's so that's that's the kind of power problem. So databases do a lot of these. Database kind of program does a lot of these. And there's a little variation on this one. So you can say that if if a writer comes, right, what happens? How much harder they get in, right? So you can either have a case where if a writer comes, no further reads are allowed till the writer gets to write the content. So there are many re readers and a single <coughs> writer, right? So when there are many readers which are doing their reading and a writer comes in, the writer can say, 
Any further reader which comes in should wait. You clear out all the readers who are doing their jobs, right? And then I get to write, and then you get to go back to reading, right? The other model is to say, read the, wait, the writer waits till there are no more readers. If a lot of readers keep coming, then the write never goes through, right? So these are two different variations of the same problem, and depending on what you're trying to achieve, you would choose one or the other, right? And they expose either a starvation problem, which, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit in a, in a couple of slides. So basically the idea is, if you're trying to implement one of the, you know, the, one or the other variation, so if you expect the, the other readers to wait while this writer has to go through, right, then if there are too many writes, then the, um, the readers would, would have to wait for a while. So the, the system throughput and all will, will change. If you expect that all reads have to finish before you go to the um, go to the right, right? If there's a lot of reading, then you may never, never get a chance to write. So the read, the right thread will start. Right? And I'll see what we're solving for a bit. The other problem is the dining philosopher problem. Right? You might have heard about this problem. It's a it's a classic problem. It 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 shows a whole lot of issues with how synchronization and deadlocking works. So depending on the nationality of the philosophers, they can either be eating with the fork or chopstick, right? So the, the fundamental thing is there are a bunch of five, uh, there are five philosophers, right? And the ne in the next chapter, we'll see why this five is more interesting than, say, two, right? So there are five philosophers. They think for a while, then they eat, right? They think for a while, uh, for a random amount of time, and they eat. And to eat, they need both the chopsticks for both this stuff, right? So these are, if you look at them as a computer science stuff, these are resources. So they need both these resources to eat, right? Once they're done eating, they release both the resources. They, they put both the forks down, right? So there is one fork between each of the philosophers, and that figure looks like the, there's two chopstick for between those two philosophers, right? Actually, there's only one chopstick, so the, you need one left and one right. There's no, I don't know if you can see the right by the mouse pointer, right? But the, but the idea is there's only one. So I need the left and the right to proceed, right? So depending on what order we do this stuff, right, it can lead to deadlock or starvation. Right, and the, the 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 notion of deadlock is the is the focus of the next chapter, but basically the idea is deadlock and um, let me go back to that. Yeah, so the so the idea is if the philosophers don't get to eat for a long time, then they get to starve. Right, so if they couldn't get the left and right fork within a reasonable amount of time, then they would starve. Deadlock is a condition where Nobody can make progress, right? And we'll see how deadlock is possible in this one and how you may avoid or fix some of those stuff. But basically, this is a very, very good, easy way to explain some of the problems that you'll run into when you're, when you're trying to do these primitives, right? And the reason is there are five threads, right? Each philosopher is a thread, and five of them do remaining processing and critical section, right? Critical section is, is them eating. And there are shared resources, there's only five of them, right? So all of them cannot eat at the same time because there's not enough folks, right? So they have to go make take terms. And so we look at the solutions to see if the solution is completely safe where you only let, you know, be very conservative, then you will avoid deadlocks and your system will be extremely slow. The, the philosophers will starve. If you let it go a little faster, there's a potential of deadlocks, and how we deal with them is, is what we focus on for the next class. There's another problem, which is the sleeping barber problem, which is not exactly in your <coughs> textbook on the on the section we discussed, but it's in the exercise section, right? So basically, the idea here is there's a there's a barber, and he or she has a number of chairs, right? Um, number of chairs in the waiting room, and they have one chair that where they can cut cut um, cut the hair. So when you go, if there's if there's nobody waiting, the barber goes to sleep. 
and the first thread which first person who walks in makes up the barber right if there are more threads than the number of chairs in the waiting room the people who come after that leave right so there's only one barber who gets to cut your hair right and you have like a bonded buffer kind of problem so you have a certain number of threads which can wait to get their hair cut and if there's more then they leave right so the, these are considered to be classical problems and they happen in different cases so when you write programs you'll notice them for you notice this kind of a st style for different um, kinds of context right so I, I touched upon the notion of a deadlock and starvation even though we, we don't go further into that into that right but the idea here is it's it's part of the third principle we looked at before you want to make progress so if there's no possibility of progress, it's called a deadlock. And you'll see how that happens a lot on the barber problem and why it will happen. But on the other hand, if it takes a long time for you to get your food, the, the philosophers starve, right? You want to avoid, you want to avoid starvation. I mean, you want to make sure starvation does not happen often, but you definitely want to avoid deadlock because when deadlock happens, nobody can make progress, right? So that's it. So our next goal is to look at two primitives that are typically used and how they can be used for solving some of these um, the synchronization problems. Right? The first one is a, is a notion of a semaphore. And the reason why we have semaphore is the, the last solution we looked at, the test and set uh, and swap mechanisms, are not very easy for end users to use. You, you have to write those piece of code into your into your program, right? So before your critical section, you have to have an entry section and an exit section. The entry section and the exit, exit section should do the test and set properly, right? And for normal programmers, they may forget or miss something. So one of the higher level constructs that you can think of is the notion of a semaphore, right? With a semaphore, semaphore is basically an integer, right? And you can initialize it to whatever, but after you initialize it, this, there are two operations that are atomic defined by your programming language. So if you're using a Python library or something, it gives you atomic operation called wait and signal, right? Which operate on this semaphore. And what it does internally, we'll, we'll see in, in the next lecture how it, how it does certain things. But basically, the functionality is trying to implement is wait basically decrements the, uh, tries to decrement the sum of four as long as it's positive, right? If it, if it gets to zero, then it waits on a, either, either spin locks on the little loop, on the no-op loop, or it does other stuff, right? So if you, if you call wait, wait will not return till you could decrement the sum of four. If the sum of four is zero or less, actually, if the sum of four is zero, then it'll wait and then it'll return back to you when the sum of four could be decremented, right? And signal increments the sum of four. So when you start out, depending on how you initialize the sum of four, <coughs> right, you can have as many uh, number of threads which can get in, right, before you stop it, right? So if you set the sum of four to be one, right, that means you can only have one thread inside the critical section. Right? So the first one which comes around would get to um, decrement it, go inside the critical section. The second one would have to wait. If you set the thread to be a higher number, we call it counting sum of four, but basically that allows that many threads to get in. So if you set, set the thread to be, uh, sum of four to be say five, right? so the first thread which comes in would decrement it, make it go to four, and it can go in, right? Three, go in. So if you have a critical section and if you put the weight and, um, if you put the weight and signal, weight in the entry section and signal the, at, the, at the exit, right? You can allow that many threads to go in, right? So you can either have it use it as a binary or a, a counting number, and depending on what you use, you may be able to implement the different stuff uh, that we kind of talked about, the classic problem, right? So if you're talking about multiple readers, then you want a sum of four which has more than one, right? 
Um, so here is a say, say piece of code, right? That you can use with the sum of four, right? You, you you start out by initializing the variable synchronize, you know, sync to zero, and you have two processes p two and p one, right? The code that p two does is wait and a bunch of statements, right? And P1 has statements and signal, right? What do you think will happen to this piece of code? What is this trying to achieve? Yes? It's going to allow process one to uh, execute its statements before process two. Can it do anything else? I don't think so. If sync is initialized to zero, then process two is going to wait. Process two can't uh, go past the wait statement until process one has called signal. Mm -hmm. So, does that make sense? So it defines the order in which these two threads have to run. That's, that's excellent, right? So it defines order. So P two cannot proceed till P one completes, right? So P one has to do whatever statement. It has a signal which increments the sync to one. Which the other way can uh, can decrement, right? So with this little piece of code, you can actually define what order things should execute. So even if you have, even if the threads get assigned to different CPUs, P1 has to happen before P2 should happen, right? So that, that so this is one way of using some of force to implement something else. That makes excellent point. So even a uh, even a uh, sorry a higher level abstraction to some of those is the notion of monitors, right? Monitors takes away even the little notion of keeping track of which should start, which should end, you know, the, the signaling and everything. And basically, it's a, it's a programming language construct, and you basically say, I want this whole procedure to be protected by a monitor. Right, and only one thread can go, and so I don't have to worry about the synchronization, all those things. So any thread, any any function that I want to be protected, I call it a monitor. So in this case, if you say monitor, monitor name, all the functions inside here can have only one thread executing through them, right? So again, this should be supported by the programming language, but if it does, so. This may be an easy way to write your code. If you think this is a critical section, just put, make it a monitor, and everything should work fine, right? So that's the that's the assumption. The one of the problem is if you use these monitors without understanding what's going on, you will make your program go very slow, right? If you just if you get some kind of a, if you if you know that there's a concept called monitor, and you notice your program is running into some synchronization problem. You don't have time to deal with debug them. If you put a giant monitor across the whole program, right, you won't have synchronization problem, but your program is basically single threaded at that point. It'll it'll be very slow, right? And so most of you I guess know Java, right? No? Okay, how many of you I'm been teaching Java in the to the programming class? C plus plus. Okay. The one which is current current. Hmm. Anyway, so <laughs> if you have, if you don't know Java, right? Java uh, supports this notion of synchronize. So if you call a method synchronize, right? Java methods are similar to your your C counterparts, C plus plus counterparts. So if you notice, uh, if you make a method, if you put a synchronize keyword before that, then that operates as monitor, right? Has anyone of you used synchronized in calls? Okay. Um, do you understand the precise semantics of how synchronized works? Uh, exactly. But you say like synchronize, and then like the name of the, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, whatever mm -hmm. the, the block. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
then the synchronized will protect them. If you have two instantiations of the object, then they are two different stuff. They don't get synchronized. And the synchronization is across the object, not across methods, right? So if you have P1 and Pn, if P1 is in a monitor, right, and you expect P2, Pn to be in a different monitor, it doesn't happen, right? Even though you say P1 is a monitor uh, synchronized and Pn is synchronized, right, only one of them can be operating in this object because they're all, the lock is based on the object, not on the method, right? So, the lot of, if you don't precisely understand how Java works, right, then you, you see weird things happening. So if you have instantiation of an object as two different instantiations, the monitors don't protect those two because they are considered different. So it has to be the same instantiation, not different ones. So if you don't know Java, right, bear in mind if you, when you come into Java and you see the synchronous class, and <coughs> if you remember the, you know, this course about synchronization and stuff, just slapping a synchronized on the, on the code won't solve anything, right? Worse, it'll make you feel like you have actually done something and you feel like you have um, solved your synchronization problems. But it's a lot more tricky than what you imagine, right? In fact, I, I actually prefer, at least for me, I prefer explicitly saying lock and stuff rather than trying to understand this notion of um, what, what the, you know, where the object is and all those things, right? Regardless, that's important, right? So yes, Java provides a way to use monitors, but when you use the monitors, you realize that there's no free lunch, right? All the synchronization, all the synchronization stuff expects you to understand what's going on and what you're trying to protect, right? So the other stuff is suppose you know, P1 is 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 in a monitor, Pn is in a, in the monitor, right? And but this this object can have other variables. It can have a shared variable, right? Suppose P, you know, function P2 operates on that shared variable. What do you think will happen? Right? So there's a shared variable which is shared by all the functions, all the uh, procedures P1 through Pn, right? And you only made P1 and Pn a monitor, right? You know, you had to change the, the example to make that just a monitor, right? Would, what would happen to variables which are not inside the monitor? Would the program la language protect you? Should the programming language protect you? Is that, is that clear? So, like you have a monitor P1, right? Monitor Pn, right? Then you have function P2, right? They operate on shared variable, they operate on shared variable, they operate on shared variable, right? What would happen to this program, or what should happen to this program? Would this program behave the way you expect? I would say no, because P2 isn't protected by the monitor. Mm -hmm. So if you're, like P1 through PN would mm -hmm. be protected. So if you only call P1 through PN, mm -hmm. then it, it would function correctly, but P2 isn't restricted in any way. So if P1 is running and P2 is running, then you could potentially get problems mm -hmm. because the language will say, oh, P2, you can run at any time. So go ahead and run it. Yes. but. Sometimes you actually do it this way, right? So I'm not sure how many of you exactly follow all the programming constructs that you are taught, right? It is, to me, it's like the, you should eat your, eat your spinach kind of thing, right? Yes, you know you should do that. Yes, you, you know you should protect your code monitors and stuff, but frequently you will say, well, I know that P2 can never run while P1 and Pn are running because they are different parts of the code, right? So. I'm going to put it outside the monitor, even though I know it's shared, because there's no way my program is ever going to run all of them concurrently, right? You will see these kind of uh, things creeping in, right? There's some one programmer who's 
pretty smart, understands the whole program, says, this and this is never going to happen together. I mean, they're going to happen together. This is never going to happen together because of the way my code is set. My code is set as, you know, it initializes to certain things, then these things, you know, first I do P2, then I do P1 or Pn, and then I move on. So I won't do this protection, right? And frequently they are wrong because after they go away after a month or so, right, they forget that they did this and then they bad things happen, right? So finding bugs in deadlocked code, finding bugs in these kind of a synchronization problem is the single hardest problem that you'll face when you do multi-thread program. It's not a trivial task, there's not much help for you, right? Starvation is hard to notice, deadlocks are easy to notice, but when deadlock happen, the bad things happen way before when the deadlock happens. So debugging them and, and dealing with them <coughs> is very hard. You know, you can say you should follow good programming practices and stuff, but it's it's still it's, it's still a very hard problem, right? And I, I, we'll show some of the ways of how you can deal with this stuff, but in real problems, real program, this is a hard thing, right? And that's one of the reasons why when you have the dual cores and stuff, you know, dual core processors coming out, you don't just recompile a program and then make it go, right? If you buy a dual processor laptop, your programs don't run twice as fast for free because they have to deal with these synchronization issues. And if any one of you who have written any kind of thread programs will notice that there's always some case that you miss, there's always something that you can think about. So one of the, as part of the monitor, you also implement the notion of condition variables. Um, so you, it, it supports the notion of weight and signal just like it did for some of our on a condition variable with one difference. The on a condition variables when you do a weight, right, if somebody is, so it behaves like the synchronization variable. There's no counter here. It's implicit counter. So when I, when I execute, in a condition variable dot wait, that means that if there's no one else, then I, I get to run, right? If I execute a signal, if any process is waiting, then I signal you, right? But it's not stored. So if I do a signal and no one is waiting, and then you come back to wait later, then the signal is lost, right? So this, so with the, with the condition variable, you can make the program go a little faster. You're basically doing a handoff kind of stuff. Right. So it behaves like a semaphore, except there's no explicitly you specifying what the initialization number is, and then it's not cached. So at the end of the time, it moves on to the next one. Right. So it's similar to semaphores, but the difference is it doesn't uh, know about the stuff. So that's all I have for today. Um, and we'll continue on tomorrow on trying to see how we can implement these semaphores with, with different, um, different parameters. Code, code See you on Monday.